welcome to International Forum. We are honored today to have as our special guest Joshua Bolton, former President George W. Bush's White House Chief of Staff from 2006 to the day he left office on Tuesday, January 20, 2009. The White House Chief of Staff is the highest ranking member of the Executive Office of the President of the United States. Uh, he is often said to be the second most powerful man in the country after the President who is the most powerful man not only in the United States but also in the world. Some consider the White House Chief of Staff as co-president or president's gatekeeper. Joshua Bolton had a long and distinguished career in the Bush White House. Before becoming President Bush's White House Chief of Staff, he was President Bush's Director of the Office of Management and Budget for three years. And before that, he was the Deputy White House Chief of Staff. Since fall of 2009, Josh Bolton has been teaching at the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs of Princeton University, where he is the John L. Weinberg and Goldman Sachs and Company Visiting Professor. He currently also serves with fellow Princetonian and former United States Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, who, uh, who had appeared on our program earlier as co-chair of the bipartisan Clinton-Bush Haiti Fund. An article in the September 29, 2008, Washington Post said that, and I quote, uh, Joshua B. Bolton may be one of the most discreet White House chiefs of staff ever, seldom talking on the record to the press or appearing before outside audiences. But Josh Bolton has graciously agreed to talk to us today on International Forum. And I might add that today's uh, program is part one of a two-part program with Josh Bolton. So please join me in a warm welcome to Josh Bolton. Welcome. Thank you. Very much. Welcome to the program. It's lovely to have you here with us. It's nice to be here. Yeah. You were the 22nd White House Chief of Staff in history. According to Wikipedia, and I hope they're right, White House Chief of Staff's responsibilities vary greatly from administration to administration administration, but they all do the following. They oversee at see actions of the White House staff. They manage the president's schedule. They decide who are allowed to meet with the president. And um, according to the Daily Princetonian, you're familiar with, the uh, it's the Princeton uh, student-run newspaper. Sure, I, I used to read it when I was a student every day. Right, yeah, you became, it said, the article, that you became chief of staff uh, to President Bush in the wake of increasing political problems for the administration, from Hurricane Katrina to the domestic wiretapping wire uh, controversy to rising public concerns over the war in Iraq. President Bush has come under mounting pressure from members of his own party to shake up the White House staff. And President Bush at the time was also suffering uh, from low approval ratings. What did President Bush ask you to do uh, to accomplish for him as his chief of staff? What was the mandate that he gave you? Um, you're, uh, I had worked with the president for a long time by the time I became chief of staff. Yes. Um, I, I started on January 20th, 2001 with the president at the White House. Um, his first term. His first term, the very first day. I mean, I was, uh, while the parade was still, the inaugural parade was still going on, I was uh, in my office along with my, uh, my boss and mentor, Andy Card, who was the president's first chief of staff. Mm -hmm. I had also served for the two years before that as the policy director of President Bush's presidential campaign, working out of Austin, Texas. So I had, by the time President Bush asked me to be his chief of staff in early 2006, I had already long experience uh, working for the uh, working for the president so we he knew me pretty well he knew what he was getting as a chief of staff you were uh, very comfortable with each other very comfortable and uh, I knew him well enough to know what he was looking for in a chief of staff mm -hmm. and one of the few things he said to me when he asked me to be chief of staff uh, was something you alluded to 
at the outset in your introduction, which is what he didn't want. He said, uh, I don't need a prime minister. Uh, and I knew what he meant by that, um, and by that, he, by that he meant uh, he did not need a co-president, um, which some people have often either said the White House Chief of Staff is, and some White House Chief of Staffs have even behaved a little that way, although I think mm -hmm. relatively few. The White House Chief of Staff, in most configurations, and I think usually most effectively in that role, is a staffer. I remember Andy Card used to remind us that uh, remember that staff is in the title. And, and there is a boss. There is a boss. Uh, and that's true for everybody in government, uh, even the most senior cabinet officers. Um, but it's particularly true for what is otherwise a very senior position of chief of staff, that your first responsibility in that role is to make sure that the president is as well prepared as possible to do his job not focused on your job. Your job is making sure that somebody else is as well prepared as possible to do his job. So that meant uh, taking care of the schedule, taking care of the information flow, making sure that the president was focused on the right issues, the issues he wanted to be focused on, that his time was allocated uh, for that purpose, that he was getting all of the information he needed to make good decisions, that the process was run in a way that made it possible for him to make decisions efficiently, and then once he made decisions, that the decisions were faithfully and promptly executed. That's the core function of, of the yeah. chief of staff, not to displace the president, but yeah. to enhance the president. We will look at uh, some of these uh, that you just mentioned, uh, functions uh, one by one uh, in a little bit. But first, I'm very curious. What is your typical day start at what time? When do you arrive at the White House? Uh, that varies from White House to White House. Um, I, was, I was in an early, uh, early timing White House. Uh, I'm a night owl, so this was a hard adjustment for me. But I started the adjustment when I started working for then Governor Bush in early 1999. And I was, as the policy director, I would, uh, it, was very, it was very common for me to get a call at 7 in the morning uh, from then Governor Bush, who'd already been up for at least okay. an hour and a half, uh, with something he'd read in the newspaper and wanted to know, you know, what does that mean? Or what are we say, you know, mm -hmm. what, what have we said about this issue? Uh, how should I, how would you recommend I respond to this question? So. By easily by 7 or 7.30 in the morning, even as a candidate, uh, then Governor Bush was, was on the go. For me, I, I like to stay up until midnight or 1 or even later on, on my natural clock. So I was, uh, I was often pretty bleary when the president, when the then governor called at that hour. At the White House, I, uh, I had to become more disciplined. As Deputy Chief of Staff and Budget Director, <clears throat> my first meeting of the day, my first responsibility of the day, was to be at the senior staff meeting every morning at 7.30 in the Roosevelt Room. Is that what you continue to do but chaired every day with the senior staff meeting at the White House? As Chief day? of Staff, I chaired that 7.30 meeting, but I was, as Chief of Staff, you're not allowed the luxury of showing up just before the, the senior staff meeting. As chief of staff, my first responsibility, as I just said, was to take care of the president. He would typically, this is, now this is just President Bush, he would typically get to his desk at about 6.45 every morning in the Oval Office. I needed about a half hour head start on him in the office in order to be sufficiently prepared to visit with him, which I did every morning shortly after he arrived. So you'd be there at 6, 6.15 a.m.? About 6.15 for me. My predecessor, Andy Card, uh, is a much more disciplined character, and he would typically be in the office by about 5.30 in the morning. I would do some of my preparation for the morning the night before. I might even go online and look at some of the news stories that mm -hmm. would be in the paper the next morning. Mm -hmm. um, but I needed a full half hour before I walked into the Oval Office every morning. Uh, before I felt comfortable sure. that I could talk to him about sure. what had happened overnight, what was in the newspapers, and what his day was going to be about. Now, were you the first person President Bush saw in the morning, or, 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 or will he just be there at the staff meeting? 
and and, and he'll come into the staff. Uh, our our tradition was that the chief of staff was the first person who had a had a real conversation with the president. Okay. Now the the president also has sitting right outside the Oval Office. Uh, he's had a couple of assistants, an executive assistant, mm -hmm. a personal aide. Um, so when he first walks into the Oval Office, he he'd be interacting with them. Uh, but the first person who has a real discussion, a real mm -hmm. meeting with the president, uh, in in our construct was. Yeah. was the chief of staff and it usually he would get in about 645 I would give him five or ten minutes to get settled uh, to look at some of the papers on his desk and then I would I would wander in and we would typically visit uh, for the rest of that time before 730 and typically uh, shortly after 7 the national security advisor would join us so the three of us would have a very casual and un unstructured conversation mm -hmm. with the president Mm -hmm. that went in whatever direction he wanted to go. Were, was your office right next to the Oval Office? Were you the person President Bush saw the most, would you say, other than his family? Uh, yeah, a, lot, a lot of times the President sees his family less than a few of his close aides. Um, the person the President probably sees the most is his personal aide. Is, in our case, was a young man, uh, or a series of, of young men, very capable, who have one of the toughest and least publicized jobs in the White House, which is to be physically with the president at all times. They're usually have, military personnel, are they? Uh, there's a military aide, which is which is different, oh. who uh, is is the person that carries uh, what's called the football, which is a, a leather satchel that contains the uh, highly classified communications equipment and the nuclear codes. The military aide always has to be within a certain distance of the president in case of emergency. The personal aide is not a national security official, but is the person who always knows what the president's schedule is, has his briefing book, has his speech, has his mints, his Purell, uh, whatever the president needs to, uh, to just keep functioning. So it's probably the personal aide that the president physically sees the most. But in terms of the more senior staff, the more senior interactions, uh, the chief of staff is uh, in almost all configurations the most uh, the mm -hmm. most regular person with whom the president interacts. This military staff who carries the black box, uh, what the football? The football, yeah. What branch of service is this person? Uh, there typically is one military aide from each branch because it's a very it's a very in intense job in the sense that they have to be alert at every moment, and there's one military aide on duty every second of every day, including overnight. So you have Marine Corps, Air Force, Navy, and Army. And Coast Guard. Coast Guard. Um, and they are some of the, uh, the finest members, young members typically, yes. of, yes. Uh, of our service, but uh, usually um, in uh, sometimes as, as lower a rank as, uh, as captain, but usually a major or lieutenant colonel. Um, so right. a, a young and very capable officer who often became good friends with the president and the rest of the staff right. and became, uh, you know, buddies on the, bi on the mountain bike, which the president liked to do, mm -hmm. or in the brush clearing on the right. ranch, that kind of thing. Right. Let's look at how, how you work as the president's gatekeeper. How do you set the daily schedule for President Bush? Is there some kind of... Um, procedure, standard operating procedure that you follow? Say. There, there is, and it's, it's very elaborate. Um, each White House, I'm sure, does it differently. We had a, a very efficient process that was run by a scheduler to the president. That's, there is a job, and a very significant job, that is just handling the president's schedule. It's headed by one person, but it, uh, in our case it had you know, four or five people working on nothing but the president's schedule um, because the most valuable commodity in any White House uh, isn't, the ma isn't the money, it's the president's time. And so that's doled out in literally in five minute increments. Um, <clears throat> if, if a White House isn't careful, all you end up doing with the president's schedule is his inbox. Mm -hmm. because the, every president has more coming over the transom than, uh, than can possibly done, be done by any ten people mm -hmm. in a day. Uh, so 
if if you just did triage on the inbox, you would you could completely fill the president's day. And the challenge for scheduling yeah. is to is to pick the things that you want the president to be working on, that the president wants to be focusing on proactively rather than just reacting to whatever the request or the or the crisis of the day is. So, so how do you, or how did you, actually decide who saw the president? Um, well, let me go back to just the the overall schedule before you go to the the individual segments of who gets in to see him. Mm. Um, the first step in the process is that when I was deputy chief of staff, we put on the wall a big uh, whiteboard calendar um, that was that was closed up in a in nice cabinetry that the cabinet makers at the White House made for me. And you could open up this cabinet and you could see four months. Uh, there were four panels. Um, so we would convene uh, some, of the most, some of the most senior members of the White House staff. We would convene probably at least every week and we would look over the whole four-month calendar. And we wouldn't do specific scheduling like we wouldn't say at 10 a.m. he's going to do this and at 10.30 he's going to do that. We would look at each day or each week and this was our opportunity to step back and say, the President said that he wants to focus uh, this week on homeland security or on immigration, uh, or that's where he wants, he wants to put his effort into uh, selling a social security plan. We would step back and look at the calendar and say, are we living up to that mandate to us to put the President's focus on these things? So we would look broadly at the days and say, okay, we're doing a couple of economic days. We, we're going to reserve this day for economic issues, um, but we need, to, uh, we need to add in a Homeland Security event. So let's find a Homeland Security event for Friday of, next, of, of the following week. I almost said next week, but we rarely planned that close to the event. We were typically, uh, within the month ahead, we were typically refining the schedule and we were, act, we were looking at um, structuring the schedule easily two to three months in advance. So that's the first step in the scheduling process mm. is you, you set your priorities and you say these days we're going to travel, these days we're going to focus on these sets of issues. Uh, these days is the UN General Assembly, these days is are devoted to a state visit from the president of China, something like that. Do you, yes, how, how is that, uh, these state visits, do you offer dates to the heads of state of the visiting country? Do you offer them several dates, say these are the good dates for you to visit? Yes. And they'll respond? And, the, and then you work out the exact date? Exactly. Uh, exactly how it's done, but even before that you need to decide which countries the of president course. wants to meet the head of, because almost every head of state in the world mm -hmm. uh, would love to come to Washington for a, a state visit. So uh, that's part of that bigger conversation, the broader step back conversation where the national security advisor and the national security team get together and they say, these are our priorities. And then you, we take that to the president and say, um, over the next six months, we think you ought to meet with these heads of state, or over the next year even. And the president will look at it and he'll say, um, no, I don't really want to meet with him. Uh, I, you know, my last conversation with him wasn't very productive and I don't, th I don't think it's a good use of time. Or my last conversation with her was, was confrontational. I want to I smooth things over. Let's meet with her early, that kind of thing. So the president has a, has a lot of input, especially on those kinds of big issues. Mm -hmm. And then the national security team gets together and comes to the broader scheduling group and says, we have the following eight priorities to do in the next eight months. How do we fit those in? So it's a, it's a very complicated mosaic yeah. um, because it's not just the National Security Advisor, it's the... Homeland uh, Security. Homeland Security. The governors, gov yeah. governors want to meet with the President. Right, right. Members of Congress want right. to meet with the President. Right. Uh, cabinet officers. Um, we want the President to meet uh, you know, a group from Princeton University that uh, has done some excellent research or some students that have been to Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we'd like the president to publicize and honor them in some way. So there are all sorts of competing demands. And um, like I said, with the most valuable resource in the White House being the president's time, a lot of uh, 
and efficiently running White House's time is spent mm -hmm. on how to allocate that precious resource. President Bush um, famously called himself the decider. I'm the decider. But you are the man behind the decider who decides what the decider is going to read, to, to be informed of, to see, and who he is to see. Uh, you make up these, the agenda, the schedule, uh, with all these uh, inputs from all these other entities. So in a sense, though, does you have an enormous amount of influence. Um, I've, you know, I, I knew the president well enough and I knew what his priorities war, were well enough that uh, I viewed myself as uh, basically the implementer of the president's own influence. That it wasn't, it wasn't my concept of what uh, what I thought the president's priorities would be. It's my understanding of what I knew the president's priorities to be. So um, while it's a, it's a very influential spot to be in, um, I think a good chief of staff uses that influence uh, not, to, not to promote their own agenda, but rather to fulfill the, the president's agenda. And, and I was blessed with a boss who was clear about his priorities. I mean, he wasn't just a decider. He was, some, uh, he was a president who understood very clearly what his ranking of priorities were. Um, he was able to communicate those very clearly to me. And that made it, while it's a complicated job and a delicate job to uh, manage the president's schedule, it made it relatively easy for me to set the priorities um, as to where we devote the time, who gets in and who doesn't. What were his priorities? His first priority... Domestic and international. Uh, his first priority was protecting the country. Um, that's true of every president. Um, and it was true of President Bush when he arrived in January of 2001. But uh, after 9-11, um, that, uh, that priority uh, didn't just come first. It, mm -hmm. it, it, w it was highly elevated above all other priorities um, and uh, absorbed really the, the, the lion's share of the effort and attention of the entire White House. And I thought was well, well placed. I mean, the President always put those issues first, devoted the time that they needed, devoted the resources that they needed, um, he because he, he viewed his, yeah. his first responsibility was to make sure that the country is as safe as it possibly can be. Can you give us a couple of examples of what he would do uh, in a day or when a situation arises uh, to safeguard the, nas uh, the nation's uh, national security? Because all we know is uh, uh, it's now we're now at orange alert uh, or, you know, the alert level has gone up or gone down. We don't really know what goes <coughs> on behind the scene. Um, the, the president, even, even when he first came into office, was always... Um, careful to make sure that he was he was well briefed. He met regularly with his national security team, with his in, uh, with his intelligence briefers, um, on a regular basis. But that that became even more disciplined in the aftermath of 9/11. I mentioned the 7:30 senior staff meeting mm -hmm. uh, when I when I and the rest of the senior staff went off and met in the Roosevelt Room. That was. That was usually one of the only times when the president had an opportunity on his own just to do some reading, you know, writing notes, that sort of stuff, make some phone calls. Um, but usually by 8 a.m., uh, we would have his first briefing of the day, which was always his intelligence briefing. And that meant that the uh, director of central intelligence, later the director of national uh, intelligence, would come in um, and uh, bring a briefer. Uh, the Secretary of State might well be there. The National Security Advisor and the Chief of Staff were always there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the President would spend typically at least a half hour going over um, what had happened overnight, what, um, what the intelligence community was picking up about threats to the country, um, and what was just what was going on in the world, whether it was North Korea or Iran, Venezuela, mm -hmm. um, every part of the world, if there was some development that the intelligence community thought the president ought to be informed of, 
president made sure that there was uh, that he was giving that his attention. In addition, once a week, uh, in addition to the regular intelligence briefing, which was organized by the intelligence community as such, once a week we assembled the Homeland Security team, which means which meant in the later part of the administration the uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, which was a position that was created uh, in the year after 9-11. It meant the Attorney General, it meant the Director of Central Intelligence, mm -hmm. the Director of National Intelligence, um, and eventually it meant the Director of the um, of a fusion center where all of the intelligence community came together to talk about the threats. And that half-hour meeting, in addition to the intelligence meeting, was always focused on what are the immediate threats we're seeing to the country. And the president was pretty remarkable in keeping in his head the various intelligence streams that were going on, the, uh, um, the conspiracies that might be out there. Um, something like the, uh, I don't know whether they they had any uh, initial intelligence on the recent uh, car bomb in Times Square, but that's the kind of thing where mm -hmm. uh, the intelligence community would say, "Well, we p we've picked mm -hmm. this up that there, mm -hmm. you know, that there may be something going on in New York City." The attorney general would contribute. The director of the FBI would contribute. Um, so the president spent a lot of his time, uh, not just himself monitoring to keep himself informed. Right. But it was an important emblem because he was, he was communicating to the entire rest of the government that this is job one. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's involved in this area needs to know that the president cares most mm -hmm. about keeping the country safe. We end our, the first part of our conversation. And thank you, Josh Bolton. We'll be back in a minute with part two. Uh, please join me in thanking Joshua Bolton, President George W. Bush's Chief of Staff. Uh, thank you for being with us. This is Mei Chang for International Forum. Mm -hmm.